So it's my pleasure this afternoon to introduce Dr. Blake Richards. Blake studied at the University of Toronto in cognitive science and AI, and then went on to do neuroscience. He uh, got a Google Faculty Award, and uh, he's a member of the CIFAR Learning in Machines and Brains program. He's one of those rare people, which I think our community needs to uh, pay more attention to, who are at the interface between neuroscience and machine learning. And so it's, it's really uh, a tradition that we've had at, at, at uh, iClear, but also at NIPS, to promote the, uh, this contact between our disciplines, uh, brain sciences and machine learning. And so it's, uh, you know, please uh, uh, help me welcome Blake for this uh, invited talk. Thanks very much, Joshua, and thank you to all of you for coming to see this talk, and thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me. It's a real honor, and uh, also a uh, reasonably novel pleasure, because uh, as Joshua hinted at, um, I am technically a neuroscientist, so normally that is the crowd that I'm speaking to, but my research does sit at the interface of neuroscience and artificial intelligence, and part of what I hope to convince you about today is that that interface is useful and something which is going to help machine learning in the future. So in terms of how I view that interaction, really, uh, this would be the kind of ideal virtuous cycle that I think we should be striving for in both neuroscience and machine learning. So machine learning is very helpful, in my opinion, for helping neuroscientists to interpret their data, because the brain is a very strange device, a very strange computational device. And, you know, if you just drop electrodes into it and correlate with various things in the environment, it's very hard to make sense of it. And I think machine learning can give us a handle on what's actually going on and help us to interpret that data and generate novel predictions for experimentalists. And when I speak to neuroscience crowds, that's often what I'm trying to hammer home. Um, but for machine learning researchers, I think critically, neuroscience also can provide good structural priors on the systems that you're trying to learn and provide inspiration for novel ways of solving problems that you encounter. Um, I, I actually think uh, Kristen's talk yesterday was a great example of that, thinking about active learning and thinking about the ways in which it's good to try to ad adapt the same strategy, uh, the same strategies that the brain ultimately settled on through the course of evolution. So today I'm going to run through uh, this interaction. Uh, I'm going to try to go the full cycle for you. Uh, I'm going to start with the side of how machine learning has helped us to reinterpret some neuroscience data. So we've been looking at how to do deep learning in the brain using some specific sets of dendrites, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. And then I'm going to move on and tell you a little bit about an idea that that inspired, which we call ensemble multiplexing, and which we believe has finally given us a good handle on how the real brain can do credit assignment. Once I've kind of shown you that work that, that is helping us to understand the brain, I hope to at least give you a sketch of an idea that it has led us to about novel solutions for machine learning architectures, or at least pointing towards some machine learning architectures that have been proposed in recent years, which this, uh, these, this data make us think might be the right answer. So um, in particular, I'm going to then jump to the idea that there are particular priors on your systems that you should be considering. Um, and in in particular, whether or not your, the units of a, of, a, of a neural network should in fact have states at multiple levels, which I'm going to call meso and micro states. And then I'm going to go on to talk a little bit about how that can help to implement something like dynamic routing in a neural network and why that would be useful. That second half is going to be mostly sketch, mostly an attempt to give you some inspiration. Uh, and so we'll see how it goes. All right. So let's start with deep learning and dendrites. So this is work that uh, was done uh, by my PhD student, Jordan Gurdjieff, and also in collaboration with uh, 
my good friend Tim Lillicrap, who's at DeepMind right now, and I include that picture of Tim for Adam Santoro's benefit if he's in the audience. Um, and so uh, we, you know, have been interested in the question of does the real brain engage in deep learning? Now, to some extent, trivially, the answer to that would appear to be yes, depending upon how you view deep learning. So on the, uh, on the left there, you see an image of the macaque cortex split up into various regions, and we know that visual processing in macaque cortex and in human cortex and indeed in every mammalian cortex uh, you know, proceeds by a series of stages, not unlike a multilayer neural network, and that these stages are organized in a retinotopic manner, not too unlike a convolutional neural network. So for example, you, your retinal ganglion cells convolve inputs which get passed on to the LGN, which convolve inputs which gets passed on to V1, et cetera. And so trivially, there are some analogies between deep neural networks and how the real brain works. But we want to answer something slightly deeper and more interesting, which is, does the brain utilize learning algorithms that are end-to-end? -end? That is, that ensure that changes in any part of the network ultimately help the network to achieve some learning objective, reduce some cost function, whatever that is. That's ultimately what deep learning is. Simply stacking, you know, layers of neuron units on top of each other is not it. To have a proper deep learning algorithm, you need to ensure end-to-end -end training. So, you know, the analogy I often give for neuroscientists is the question of what happens when you learn how to play violin. So, you know, obviously your actual ability to play violin is a function of your motor cortex. If we were to try to characterize the loss function for your playing violin, that loss function is going to depend upon activity patterns in your motor cortex. But that's not to say that your auditory cortex can't help you achieve that goal. As you learn to play violin, you might come to represent the correct finger positions on the neck differently from the incorrect finger positions on the neck in your auditory cortex. And so you're going to have a representation that ultimately allows your auditory cortex to shape things in a way that help your motor cortex do its job. And the, the, the thing I always say to neuroscientists when they say, ah, the brain doesn't do, do deep learning is like, look, if you have a, one person who's practiced violin for a thousand hours versus another person who's listened to violin for a thousand hours, do you think the representations in auditory cortex are going to be identical? Because if they're not identical, if the auditory cortex representations have been shaped by that motor learning somehow, you're in a deep learning field here. Okay, so the problem for neuroscience is the question of how you perform credit assignment, which is fundamentally what underlies end-to-end -end training and deep learning. And the, the, in neuroscience, everyone's very focused on what we call Hebbian or local synaptic update rules. And the reason is because there's a lot of biological evidence for these rules, and they fit nicely with our understanding of how cells work. So a perfect example is something called spike timing dependent plasticity, which you may have heard before, which says that if a presynaptic neuron spikes before a postsynaptic neuron, then you should potentiate their synapses. And this is illustrated on the left here in this shallow network. We've got two neurons, A and B. A is presynaptic to B. A is, say, a sensory input, and B is a motor output. And spike time dependent plasticity would say that if A consistently spikes before B, we want to strengthen that connection. And that's a perfectly reasonable way of assigning credit for the behaviors that B drives, because A is directly driving B, and B drives some behavior. But this situation doesn't work very well if you add even just a single extra layer on top. If you've got just one hidden layer, now whenever A spikes before B, exactly what A's contribution was to the behavior of the network at the motor output and to the ultimate loss function that depends upon that is now a function of all the downstream connections from B. And that local rule, spike time dependent plasticity, will no longer do proper credit assignment for you. So we've got this problem, and the obvious way to solve this problem if you're just into neural networks is to do backpropagation. You explicitly calculate the partial derivative of your loss function with respect to your synaptic weights, and voila, Bob's your uncle. The problem with this from a neuroscientist perspective is that backpropagation is biologically unrealistic. And the reason fundamentally is because 
if you try to implement backprop, like literally in a real set of cells rather than on your GPU or something, then what you realize is that in order to do backprop, what you need is you need a separate error pathway that has perfectly symmetric weights with your feed forward synapses. So the reason is that, you know, when you do your calculation of the output in order to determine your loss function and calculate your gradients, et cetera, calculate your error, you don't want the hidden layer units to be integrating the error signals that they may be receiving for credit assignment. So if you don't have a separate pathway so that the error signals can be kept separately slightly, you're going to have a problem. And furthermore, to follow the explicit gradient, you technically need to be sending those errors back through symmetric weights. If there are blue, red, and green neurons in the feed forward pathway as illustrated, there needs to be equivalent blue, red, and green neurons on the feedback pathway that the error is sent through. And neither of these things, the separate error pathway to keep things segregated and perfectly symmetric weights, are realistic with respect to what we know about how the brain operates. So um, I had been thinking about this for a long time, like how could the brain potentially get around this issue? And one of the things, of course, that at some point struck me, and, you know, it's funny that it's not discussed more, is that real neurons, especially in the neocortex, have a much more complicated structure than the abstract ones that we use in machine learning. So here you're seeing a reconstruction of a group of neurons from the neocortex, and I'm going to talk more about that structure in a second, but, you know, perhaps the solution lies here. Perhaps in stripping away the complexity, we actually made it harder to understand what the system was doing. So here's another image of uh, some neocortical pyramidal neurons. These are neurons that my student Matt Tran recorded from and filled with a fluorescent dye before imaging. Uh, you can see the bright little circle at the, at the uh, kind of midpoint here. That's the cell body, and it's often a bit triangular shaped, which is why they're known as pyramidal neurons. But they have this funny structure where they're almost like trees. So the cell body is deep in the neocortex, and then they have these roots that come out of them that are referred to as the basal dendrites. But then there's one dendrite that reaches up out of the top of the pyramid and sends itself off towards the surface of the brain, and then eventually creates this big branching structure at the surface of the brain, which you see here called the apical dendrites. And interestingly, anatomical work and functional work shows that these two sets of dendrites receive different inputs. So, you know, there's no certainties in biology, but broadly speaking, the way it works is that feed-forward sensory information, so for example, information about what your retina is receiving, what your skin's receiving, etc., is going to be sent to the basal dendrites of these neurons, whereas feedback information from higher areas, such as, for example, motor information being sent to your auditory cortex or visual cortex, is going to arrive in the apical dendrites. And that segregation is very interesting, and it's one which I think is potentially key to solving this problem. So my lab um, in particular has been interested in the fact that the apical dendrites have some very unusual properties. So if you look at the apical dendrites electrophysiologically, they are actually electrotonically segregated from the cell body. So if you get a synaptic input at an apical dendrite, it is more often than not not going to have any impact on the spiking activity of the cell. So what you're looking at on the right here is some recordings from experiments done by Matthew Larkham long ago now. He put electrodes on multiple parts of a single neuron. They're illustrated in red, blue, and, and gray here. So one electrode way off in the distal apical dendrites, one electrode in the middle of the apical dendrite, the blue one, and then one at the cell body, the gray one. And on the far right, what you're looking at is the result of current injection at various parts of the cell and what the other electrodes see. And on the top, in B, you'll see the impact of injecting some current into that apical dendrite electrode, the red one. And you can see a little bump, the response to that injection of current. But then notice that the blue and the black traces there show almost no response. The apical dendrite is so far electrically from the cell body that when you actually look at the impact on the cell, it's, it's negligible and almost non-existent. Now, interestingly, the spikes from the cell body can travel backwards to the apical dendrite, and that's what you're looking at in C. If you inject current into the soma and the cell spikes, that will then travel back to the apical dendrite. So they know when the cell is spiking. But how do they communicate with the cell? Well, the answer is that the apical dendrite, the branch, 
the big grant branch, has a very active zone which is rich in voltage-gated calcium channels, which I've illustrated with a green, uh, square, green rectangle there on the left. And what happens is, is that that calcium-rich zone can function basically as another activation function, as a nonlinearity. So it's almost like its own cell. The apical dendrite is almost like its own cell. It, it can spike. And if it gets activated enough, it will spike and send that information to the cell body. And what you're looking at in D and E there is the, an instance in the recordings when the apical dendrite actually engaged in one of its spikes. So E is probably the easiest one to see. If you inject a lot of current into the apical dendrite, eventually you can get it to engage in this highly nonlinear behavior where it goes way up like that. And the, the dynamics of voltage-gated calcium channels is such that they stay open longer than the sodium channels uh, that we're typically uh, associate, that we typically associate with spikes. And there's also not quite the same potassium channels to shut it off. So it lasts for a long time. And that's why neuroscientists sometimes call these plateau potentials, because there's this plateau of depolarization. And when the apical dendrite generates a plateau, then it can alter spiking at the cell body as seen in these traces. And it can, in fact, be very good at generating high-frequency bursting, which is something we're going to come back to in a second. Okay, so with these properties, we thought it would be interesting to try to build a multilayer neural network that does credit assignment using the segregated apical dendrites as a source for credit calculations. So we simulated three compartment neurons with a soma, a basal dendrite, and an apical dendrite. And then what we did is we built a very simple neural network that takes in MNIST images, converts that into Poisson spike trains, and then runs that through to these three compartment hidden units which uh, will integrate that information in their basal dendrite. The soma from those units will then send that off to another set of units in the output layer that are responsible for categorizing the images. But they will send their spiking activity back through to the apical dendritic compartment of our hidden layer. And what we do is we have the apical compartment be largely segregated from the cell body so that when for the most of the time, when the cell is receiving inputs to its basal dendrites, those are driving the activity of the cell. You can see there the basal dendrite voltage is shown in the middle trace, and the somatic voltage is shown in the bottom trace, and then the spiking output from the soma is shown in the very bottom. And so it's mostly tracking the basal voltage and the basal inputs. But occasionally, we let the uh, apical dendrite generate one of these nonlinear plateau potentials, and those are what we're going to use for credit assignment. Um, so, in fact, the way we do that is based on the framework from Yoshua's lab, the difference target propagation framework. We set up targets at the output and the hidden layer. So the target output is shown there, S hat 1, which is just going to be the target prescribed by a teaching signal that's indicated by I. Uh, and then for our hidden layer, our target is going to be the average activity of the hidden layer plus the difference between two plateau potentials a plateau potential that occurred when the output units were receiving the teaching signal and a plateau potential that occurred when they weren't, indicated by alpha T and alpha F respectively. And then we just learn on a local loss function for each of the layers, which is the difference between their average activity and their target. And uh, importantly, we send that information from the output layer back through a set of fixed random weights which actually works, and unfortunately I don't have time to talk at length about that, but I'll uh, send you in the right direction in a moment. So what happens is, is that the network learns representations that help it perform categorization of MNIST digits, which is what we want. This is like the violin example. So here you're looking at T-SNE applied to uh, the input activity. So the, this is basically just applied to MNIST. And you'll see that there are category groupings within MNIST in the first place. But there are also groupings that don't make sense for the categorization goal. So for example, all of the twos with a loop are in a very different part of space from the twos without a loop. And nines and fours that are on a slant are in the very different part of space and close to each other than nines and fours not on a slant. But what happens is the network learns to start sucking the elements of categories together and ignoring some of those low-level features that don't matter for the, for the cost function. And so when we go through two hidden layers, you can see that by the second hidden layer now, 
all of the twos are together regardless of whether or not they have a loop, all of the nines are together regardless of their slant, and all of the fours are together regardless of their slant, and they're not uh, too close to each other. So we have achieved what we hope to, which is the kind of like violin example, the early sensory layers of the network are shaping their representations to help the output layer achieve its task, which is categorization. Now interestingly, it does this with that fixed uh, feedback weight, and the reason is because of this uh, phenomenon that uh, Tim called feedback alignment. Uh, so what happens is here I'm plotting the weight updates that would be, sorry, the angle between the weight updates that would be prescribed by our algorithm and the weight updates that would be prescribed by proper back propagation. And if you take any two vectors in a high dimensional space, they're going to be orthogonal to each other, like any two random vectors in a high dimensional space, they'll be orthogonal to each other. And indeed that's where our algorithm starts. It's orthogonal to back propagation on the very first epoch. But as learning proceeds, it actually drops, that angle drops below 90 degrees and it starts pushing the network in a similar direction towards what the proper gradient would be as prescribed by back propagation. Um, that's particularly true if we actually send the voltages of the output layer back. The spiking output, uh, which is shown in blue, makes it a bit noisier and it doesn't end up pushing in quite the same direction. But still, the, the, the same principle holds. And the result is that if you look at the receptive fields that the network is learning, it's ultimately very similar to the receptive fields that you see if you learn with back propagation. And you can see that both qualitatively and if you actually take the maximum Pearson correlation coefficient for the receptive fields that we learned with backprop versus ours, and then some shuffled versions of that same data. Now exactly why this works, I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave because uh, I don't have time to discuss it in this talk, but if you're interested, I recommend that you check out Tim's paper that was in Nature Communications in 2016 that outlines this feedback alignment effect and helps to explore that question of why does it not matter if you have symmetric feedback weights. Okay, so interim summary number one, we think that the apparently odd structure of pyramidal neurons may actually reflect the brain's solution to the credit assignment problem. It may stick those apical dendrites way out at the top of the brain's surface and electrically very distant from the soma so that it can engage in credit calculations without interfering with ongoing processing. All right. Now, the second thing is this has led us to a concept which we call ensemble, ensemble multiplexing, and that's what I'm going to tell you about now. So this is work, again, done with Jordan and also that we've been doing in collaboration with Thomas Menard, from, who's currently at Mila but visiting us in Toronto, and uh, Richard Nod, who's at the University of Ottawa. So um, to come back to that uh, illustration of how pyramidal cells operate, uh, remember I pointed out that these plateau potentials that occur in the bottom, in the bottom right in D and E there are uh, very good at driving burst firing in neurons. And so Richard, in a study with Henning Spreckler, wondered whether or not that would mean that bursts could be a very distinct signal from non-bursts for communicating top-down information. So what he did was he did a biophysical simulation of a group of pyramidal neurons, an ensemble is what he called it, and uh, he examined, so, so he fit the, the biophysical simulation to the data from Matthew Larkham's lab, and then he examined how the neurons responded if they received the same set of input to their somas or to, like, which is supposed to represent kind of that basal compartment, or to their apical dendrite. And what he then looked at was what happens if we look across the ensemble, across the ensemble, and we ask the question, is the cell spiking or bursting either, which he called an event, and then given an event, what is the probability of an event being a burst? And what he discovered, which was very interesting, is that when you look across the cells, this is effectively a multiplexed signal. So um, if bursts and spikes are both treated as events, and we consider both the event rate versus the probability of an event being a burst, what we get are the bottom-up versus top-down inputs, respectively. So on the right here, you're looking at an experiment where he injected two different types of current into the apical or uh, somatic compartments, shown in red and blue, respectively. And if you just look at the firing rates of the neuron, they don't seem to be carrying any information about either of these signals. But if you look at the event rate, shown on the bottom, it seems to be tracking the input to the, ba the, the somatic compartment.
whereas the probability that any of the events is a burst seems to be tracking the input to the, den to the apical dendrites. So that suggests that you can send top down and bottom up signals simultaneously through an ensemble of pyramidal neurons without having to worry about these discrete plateau events and just kind of stopping everything and learning in that moment, which is what we did in our original simulations. So we've taken Richard's idea, Richard's idea and run. Um, and this is motivated in part also by, I want to recognize the work of uh, Conrad Cording uh, from 2001, who kind of first sketched out this idea, but um, we're now following up on it finally. So what we do is we say that each unit in our neural network is actually an ensemble of neurons. It's no longer just a single neuron. And we say that each unit then has an event rate, which we call HK, as well as a probability of an event being a burst. P, uh, so here K is indexing the layer, because we're going to have a multi-layered network. So HK is the, the event rate for the neurons, for the units, sorry, because each unit is multiple neurons at layer K, and PK is the probability of the events being a burst at that layer. And then we talk about the burst rate, which is simply the product of those two things. And by having these two different streams of information, we can then engage in credit assignment in an online fashion without actually having to stop everything when a plateau potential occurs. So for the feed forward information for the event rate, we calculate that in the standard way that you would for any neural network unit. We just take a linear integral and then run that through a nonlinearity, such as, for example, the sigmoid function. For the apical dendrites, though, we do something slightly more complicated. So another thing that's interesting about neocortical circuitry is there are repeated microcircuit motifs that you see occur all throughout the entire neocortex. And one of those is this microcircuit motif. So pyramidal neurons are exclusively excitatory. They comprise 75% roughly of the neurons in the neocortex, but they're surrounded by this vast array of diverse interneurons. One of those types of interneurons is called somatostatin positive interneurons. They're called that because they express this particular peptide, somatostatin. And what's interesting about these somatostatin positive interneurons is they receive inputs from the local pyramidal cells, but they then in turn target the apical dendrites of those pyramidal cells. And so if we're right that the apical dendritic compartment is critical for understanding credit assignment, then these cells would presumably be involved in credit assignment. So we incorporate them into our model. We assume that there's also a group of somatostatin positive cells that are receiving the burst rate from our pyramidal ensembles and then inhibiting their apical compartments. So that the apical voltage, and this is slightly simplified, apologies to, to Thomas and Jordan, but the apical voltage then becomes the integral of the top-down burst rates uh, here minus the recurrent inhibition shown here. And then the product, uh, sorry, the, the probability of an event being a burst is simply the sigmoid applied to that voltage value. Uh, and then our burst rate is the product as previously stated. Okay, so, um, oops, sorry. So we run the network in continuous time effectively. And at each time, we assume a one time step delay for transmission through layers of the network. So again, we're just going to operate on MNIST here. My, apologi my apologies, but neuroscience is only just getting to MNIST. Um, now, uh, so then what we do is we nudge the network at a particular time. So we just give it a nudge in the right direction. What I mean by that is that at the time shown with the asterisk there, we will make the output unit's activity actually be a convex combination of the output they're giving and the correct answer. So the network's getting pushed towards the right answer. And then that push is going to propagate down through the network. And we're going to use the difference between what the network was doing before and after that nudge propagates down through the network in order to train the network. And this is an idea that Yashua's group has been working on with their equilibrium propagation stuff, and which ultimately uh, comes from an idea that uh, Jeff Hinton originally proposed at NIPS in 2007 is my understanding. So what we do is we define the loss function for any given layer. So here again, K is indicating our layer. So the loss for the feed forward weights at layer K at time T star um, becomes the temporal difference between the burst rate uh, when the nudge was received and before the nudge was received. And then we just perform gradient descent on that. 
Um, the other thing we do is we train those recurrent inhib inhibitory weights. So we set a target for the voltage in that compartment, gamma, and then we pick that usually close to zero, and we just do gradient descent on that as well. And the reason we do that is to avoid vanishing gradients. Because what we want to be able to do is to send our nudges back through the network in a manner that is linear, so that we can stack as many layers on top as we want. Now, at this point, we're not, but even still, you can see the impact of this. So, before we do the training with the recurrent inhibition, the burst probabilities are shown in blue there, and it's all across the sigmoid function, including in saturating zones, which are going to kill our ability to propagate those gradients properly. But after training with the recurrent inhibition, we're now sat nicely in the linear zone of the sigmoid function, so we can actually do credit assignment properly. Um, this was an idea that was inspired, inspired from work by Walter Sen and Yashua Bengio. Uh, it's a great paper. If you get a chance, read it. Sacramento et al. 2017. Okay, so what happens? Well, so here we are on training error, and so what we're going to compare to is vanilla backprop because we're not doing any fancy optimization. We're not doing anything like convolutions. We're literally just, these are fully connected nets trained with a pretty vanilla algorithm. So our best comparison point is backprop. And what we find is that we perform as well, if not better than backprop on MNIST. So there you see the results on the training error, and there's the results on the testing error. And, you know, for a vanilla one layer, one hidden layer neural network with 500 hidden units, 1.82% error isn't bad. And it at least means that we're solving the credit assignment problem. So we know that we're actually doing proper communication of the credit information. Um, now, interestingly, the other thing that this does for us is it makes our network more, sorry, the thing that our inhibitory network does is it makes us more robust in the face of weird weight initializations. So if we start the network off with really wacky weights that are way too high or something like that, it would normally not be able to learn, which you see in the red and gray traces, where we either fix the inhibition weights or we don't train them at all. Um, but if we train our inhibition weights, then we can bring ourselves back to something reasonable, even with really wacky weight initializations. So it makes the system slightly more robust to odd initializations, which is kind of cool, I think. Okay, so interim summary number two, neocortical microcircuits may actually use this ensemble multiplexing idea for credit assignment and inhibition to prevent vanishing gradients. So this is leading us to reinterpret all of this old neurophysiological data on apical dendrites and somatostatin interneurons to think about how they could actually be implementing something like deep learning. Now, but to bring this back to the question of how this can inform AI now, um, what I'm going to suggest is that this work also points us towards some interesting directions for novel network architectures that I want you to think about. And uh, they're semi-novel. Um, Jeff Hinton has thought about them before, and I've learned over the course of my life to always anticipate Jeff having thought about something that I thought of first. Um, but uh, I think it, it at least it's interesting to see that hint from the neuroscience. So here, here we go. Okay, so what is the best analogy for a unit in a neural network? Typically, we think of each unit in the neural network as being a neuron. That's probably why we call them neural networks. But what our work that I just presented to you is suggesting is that maybe a better way of thinking of units in a neural network is that each unit is actually a group of neurons. And it should be said that this is an idea that goes all the way back to the original parallel distributed processing books. They were careful to be agnostic in those books about what exactly their units were. Jeff told me he thought that was a cop-out, but I think they were actually wise to take that tact because I think it's not clear that it is a cop-out. I think, in fact, it might be a better way of thinking about them. And here's another hint from the biology that suggests that's the case. So one of the interesting things about uh, the biology of, of the neocortex is, okay, so when you're building your neocortex when you're a baby, you've got these embryonic progenitor cells that are ultimately going to give rise to the neurons. And so they're going to bud off little neurons here, and those neurons will ascend through this pole that they provide to get up to the higher layers of the neocortex. Uh, and uh, then um, what's interesting is you can track the, uh, you can track what happens to the cells that derive from the same progenitor cell. And what's interesting is that neurons that derive from the same progenitor cell are in early life, 
directly electrically coupled to each other and in later life coupled to each other through chemical synapses. And they're much more so likely to be than cells that didn't derive from the name neural same neural progenitor cell. And you can also see that they have similar connectivity because when you then measure their functional attributes, such as orientation selectivity and visual cortex, neural progenitor cells will tend, sorry, sister cells, so cells that derive from the same neural progenitor, will tend to have the same functional properties as one another. And so it suggests that the cells that are butting off of these neural progenitor cells, the sister cells as it were, are in fact uh, somehow more likely to be connected to the same partners and more likely to connect to each other, which indicates that they more, might form something like an ensemble. So the other thing that this would then get us to think about is if we're thinking about our units in a neural network and we're thinking of them not as being a single neuron but as being multiple neurons, we now have to differentiate between two different states of the unit, the mesoscopic state and the microscopic state. I picked the word mesoscopic rather than, mic rather than macroscopic because I would take macroscopic to be like the entire network or something like that or an entire layer perhaps. So by mesostate, what I mean is just what we were modeling earlier, things like the event rate across the ensemble or the probability of an event being a burst across the ensemble. Whereas for the microstate, what we mean is the specifics of which neuron is spiking or which neuron is bursting, shown with the blue and red neurons there. And what's interesting about this setup, of course, is that not unlike the kind of distinction between macro and microstates in statistical mechanics, we have a situation where multiple microstates are going to correspond to the same mesostate. So here we've got an event rate of 3 out of 5 divided by the time step, a burst probability of 1 out of 5, and here we also have that. But now it's a different set of neurons that are spiking and a different set of neurons that are bursting. So you can have many different microstates for your unit while keeping the same mesostate. And why would you want to do this? Why is that a good thing to do? Well, what struck me when I first encountered this was what it might do is it might force a good structural prior on you to represent the presence of various latent variables in the environment uh, while still representing the specifics of their instantiation differently with your microstates. So if you see your friend Sarah, you recognize her face, you have, you know, a representation at the meso level for Sarah's presence, but then you can represent the specifics of her facial expression differently with your microstates. And that will impact the way in which you react to her and potentially how you route that specific information about Sarah's presence. Um, so this is actually interestingly reminiscent of Jeff's capsules idea, I realized once I saw his paper. And uh, I think it's kind of cool that in trying to understand how to do deep learning in a biologically plausible manner, what we ended up settling on was a structural prior that basically pointed towards the capsule networks. And that was not by design, to be clear. I, 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 like, I had been thinking about this prior to reading the capsules paper. Um, so, you know, it might be that that is actually a really good structural prior to implement in your neural networks. Now, the other interesting thing that it buys you, though, uh, is multiplexing. Uh, so I'm going to come to that in a second, but just to summarize that, I'm going to propose to you that it may be time to start thinking about units in neural networks differently. You know, we've had a lot of traction with the standard linear following with the nonlinearity applied to it, but I don't see any reason not to have units that might have states at multiple levels of representations. And that might actually be a beneficial way for uh, kind of packing together information that's related. Uh, so the last thing I want to talk about is uh, then what this does for dynamic routing. So for those of you who know the capsules work, you all ought to be familiar with this. But let's think about this situation that we have here with the meso and microstates for a second. So we've got at the meso level two units that have a weight between them, which I've shown here with this cursive W. And at the micro level, what we actually have is synaptic connections between each of the neurons in the two units. And so when we consider what the mesoscopic weight is, it's ultimately going to be something like the average of the microscopic weights, of course. But now when we actually think about what's going to happen in practice, if we have, say, 
these two neurons active, the mesoscopic weight is going to be a function of the weights that connect those active units to the downstream network. And the inactive units aren't going to contribute to the mesoscopic weight. If we have a different set of active units, we're going to have a different mesoscopic weight. And so what that means is that at any given point in time, you're going to be sampling from different weights between your units, depending upon what the microscopic states are. Um, the other thing that you might have is actually some postsynaptic modulation of this as well, because different cells might be more or less receptive to their inputs. So for example, if the cell in green is already slightly depolarized and the cell in gray is being inhibited, then it could be that effectively you have downscaled the weight to the green neuron, sorry, to the gray neuron and upscaled the weight to the green neuron. So you've got these additional coefficients on your microscopic weights that are determining your, ensemble, your, your mesoscopic weight. Um, so that leads us to the idea that ultimately the microscopic weights can remain fixed while the mesoscopic weights will change at each time step depending upon the microstates in the units. And I think that this might actually be a very powerful mechanism for doing very interesting dynamic routing in your network in order to funnel information in different directions depending upon what's going on. So the formulation that we're working on right now is the idea that we've got this binary vector S at T to represent our presynaptic neuron spiking and some real vector A of T to represent the postsynaptic receptivity to uh, its inputs. And our mesoscopic weight is actually going to be the, the product of these two vectors with the microscopic weights. And this is then going to allow us to route information differently. So for example, you might have a situation where the network is initially uh, running activity. This is a very toy example, but it, say activ activity tends to flow through this red pathway shown here. But then we get some change in our higher level goals or arousal state, which alters the microscopic state at this level of the network. And now you're going to get a different flow of information. So you're going to get a contextual ability that you wouldn't have had otherwise without those, that distinction between the microscopic states and the mesoscopic states. And this is something that, that is, again, reminiscent of some of the ideas that are floating around in, in Jeff's capsules stuff. Okay. I unfortunately don't have any results on this to show you because we're working on it now. So hopefully I will uh, next eye clear. But to summarize, um, what I did was I spent a while telling you about our research trying to understand how deep learning could actually operate in the real brain. And in particular, our interest in how the apical dendrites might be a site for credit assignment and how we can multiplex top-down and bottom-up signals using this ensemble multiplexing ideas of Richard's. Um, but then I highlighted the fact that this ended up leading us through chance to this idea of units that are actually comprised of multiple neurons with mesoscopic versus microscopic states. And that this would allow a kind of contextual routing that might not be available in traditional neural network architectures. And so what I'm going to suggest to you is that this is exactly the kind of input that you should seek from neuroscience from time to time, is novel ideas for how to potentially do things in ways that you hadn't been considering yet. Um, and so I hope that this was then useful for you, and I'll be curious to see if anyone can ever take this idea and really get something like capsules or other things working in a massive way. Um, so to conclude, I think the success of deep learning shows how important it is to have a solution to the credit assignment problem, and this is something I keep saying to neuroscientists again and again, but I probably don't have to convince you of. Uh, and when we consider how the brain might solve the credit assignment problem, what's cool is we can reinterpret previous biological data. And all of a sudden, things like the weird shape of the apical dendrites, their nonlinear properties, those SST interneurons that target them, start to make more sense. And we can start to tell a story about what's actually going on in the neocortex. And ultimately, our model suggests that the apical dendrites, burst firing, and inhibitory microcircuits may all have evolved to enable something like credit assignment in the neocortex. And it's cool that this has led us to the conclusion that perhaps units in neural networks may best be understood as ensembles, which could provide some potential guidance for new forms of neural network architecture. Um, so with that, I'd like to acknowledge the work of Jordan Gurdjieff and Thomas Menard on this, also my collaborators Timothy Lillicrap and Richard No. And uh, we've also got some, excitingly, the Allen Brain Institute is going to be testing some of these ideas for us in collaboration with Joel Zabelberg at Denver and Joshua Bengio.
uh, and of course my various funding bodies and all of you for listening. Thanks. Thank you, that is fascinating. Thanks. Um, I'm very curious, when you mentioned that these ensembles often came from the same parent ne neuron, Yes. Um, you mentioned them climbing up into the hierarchy. So yes. is the ensemble only in one layer or in multiple layers? No, so, so sorry. So to clarify, the, uh, the neocortex is a layered structure, but the layers of the neocortex don't actually correspond to the layers of a deep neural network. So the layers of a deep neural network ultimately correspond to different, re uh, I'm not going to get there in time. The layers of a deep neural network ultimately correspond to different regions of the neocortex. And then those layers refer to the structure of the microcircuit. So when I was talking about the neurons climbing up, they're climbing up through the layers of the neocortex. So each region, which would correspond to a layer, would have its own progenitor cells generating neurons. Very quick question. I didn't see any skip. I, I don't know anything about yep. the brain. Are there uh, skip connections in the brain? Yes. <laughs> that was easy. Thank you. Lots. A few? Lots. Yeah. Uh, hi. Thanks for a great talk. Um, I had a question about, I think, the second part of your talk, uh -huh. um, the part using uh, modeling SST inhibitory neurons. You mentioned yes. that there are lots of other different kinds of inhibitory neurons, and yes. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about those and which ones you're incorporating into your next school model. Sure. So um, one of the interneuron types that we're most interested in is this interneuron type, which uh, unfortunately I don't have a diagram of in these slides, which was foolish. Uh, called the VIP interneuron. So these, these express a peptide called vasoactive intestinal peptide, I think. And what's interesting about these neurons is they receive neuromodulatory signals that indicate when rewards occur. So they would actually be a way of having a system that can do supervised or reinforcement learning in the same network by potentially activating credit assignment in moments when positive reinforcement has occurred. And that's something that we're very interested to explore. But the field of interneurons is huge, and there's a lot of diversity there that we're only just starting to understand. Yep. Hi, um, I have a question in three parts. Um, first, the model you trained with uh, inhibitory connections. Um, yes. It wasn't clear to me, were those just self-inhibitory? Or did, did they extend out um, you know, into um, intra-ensemble uh, neurons, or were they inter-ensemble? Yep. That's part one. Uh, part two is, is, is the, the answer to that, to that question, is it well supported by the biology? Yep. And okay. uh, part three is, I haven't seen inhibitory connections in CAPSNET, but um, has Jeff already thought of this? Yeah. <laughs> I'll answer three first. As I said, my bet is just going to be yes, Jeff's probably thought of this, but I don't know. Uh, to answer your first two questions, uh, so the way it works is that the SST inhibition is uh, inter-unit. Inter so one ensemble unit activity can also inform the inhibition that other ensembles receive, which is in line with the biology, to answer your second question, because the neurophysiology suggests that the inhibitory interneurons form a much wider blanket of inhibition, as the term neuro neurophysiologists use for it, uh, than the projections that are formed by the excitatory cells. All right, one last question. So uh, in one of the, the images you showed of the model of the, the neuron, you, you represented this area full of calcium. Yes. Right? And you said that it also acts like a, a nonlinearity. Yes. I was, I was wondering how in the ensemble, how could this, long, you said it also sometimes it, it can spike and activate the, the dendrites, right? Yes. In the ensemble, how could that actually model these potential spikes in from this area. Right. Okay. So what happens is basically <clears throat> so to come back to this stuff here. So if you look in D, one of the things that Matthew Larkham has shown is that one of the best ways to generate a plateau potential, this nonlinearity in the dendrite, is actually if you have coincident activation of both the somatic compartment and the apical compartment. 
and, and that's what's shown in D here. So if you activate them at roughly the same time, that's really good for driving these things. And what's interesting about that is that now when you think about the ensemble multiplexing idea, if you have an event, then you also get some top-down input. That's that coincident activation that, that Matthew was looking at. So what that's going to translate into is that whenever you happen to get top-down input at the same time that you were generating an event, you're going to have a very high likelihood of converting that into a burst because of the generation of that plateau potential. So that's the mechanism by which this is envisioned to work. All right. Let's thank Blake Richards one more time.